Oh, South Africa's free. The world's getting freer. South Africa's sorted. Right, what should I put on my banner now? During apartheid, the prison you could see, the bloodline branch managers of South Africa, the Oppenheimer family, controlled 80% of the stock on the South African stock market. They own the diamond and gold mines on which that country's economy depends. And they own the media through various frontmen. Then they put Mandela into the presidency. Five years after Mandela, now we have Thabo Mbeki as president. Great changes have taken place on the surface. And of course, great changes must have taken place in reality because South Africa's free now. I read it somewhere. Was it Daily Telegraph? Was it the Times? I don't remember. One of them. They told me. And great changes have take place, taken place in reality. Today, years and years after black majority rule and freedom, the Oppenheimer family only own or control 80% of the stock and more on the South African stock market. They only own the diamond and gold mines on which that country's economy depends. And they only control the media through various frontmen, not least an Irishman, a Kissinger clone called Tony O'Reilly. In other words, the same hands are on the tiller that were before. But where are the protests now? Where are the clamour for human rights? Silence. Because overt control with bars has been replaced by covert control without bars. And that has happened all over the planet. And we'll see as we go along how this prison without bars has been created and how it can be maintained. I mentioned that the Oppenheimers were the bloodline branch managers of South Africa. This is how it works. In London particularly, Europe in general, you have the epicenter of operational manipulation of the Illuminati, by the Illuminati. And then in the various countries, you have what I call the bloodline branch managers, who orchestrate the financial and political um, systems and institutions in their sphere of influence, in their country. and. A decision comes down the line, it's like the spider in the center of the web here, comes down the line and that um, bloodline branch manager family or families then introduce that agenda or that aspect of it in their own sphere of influence. In America, the bloodline branch managers are the Rockefellers, the Mellons and what are called the Eastern Establishment Families of the United States. So. Sod it, let's get bizarre now. Let's get really bizarre, I don't bloody care. What the heck are these bloodlines that have been working through these various peoples, particularly the white race, all this time? Like I said at the start of this little chat thing, I follow information and I'll go where information takes me. And if it's bizarre, if the information supports it, I'll go. And from about May 1980, 1990 rather, rather than 1998, around May 1998, a series of astonishing synchronistic events started happening in my life with a very seriously obvious common theme. In a period of May 1998, traveling around America, talking at a different in a different city every night. I met 12 different people from very different walks of life who told me the same story of their experience. That was of seeing people overwhelmingly in positions of power, but not always, but overwhelmingly so, changing from human form to a humanoid reptilian form in front of their eyes and then going back to, to a human form. Now you hear one and you think, oh my, what's going on here then? And you hear two and you think, oh God, not another. Three, four, five, six, seven. And you start to say, what's going on here? And I started to listen and compile and put together what they were saying. And I must say the common themes of their descriptions were phenomenally commonly uh, described. 
I then come back to Britain and I go to meet somebody, um, had arranged to meet, who was the wife of the warden of a notorious area for satanic activity um, on the outskirts of London called Burnham Beaches, which is owned, just a coincidence, nothing to worry about, by the city of London, the financial district of London, the epicenter of the Illuminati. And I went to talk to her, not about reptilians and shape-shifting reptilians, but about her experience of seeing satanic ritual take place in Burnham Beaches at night, in which her husband was involved, that's why he was warden of the whole area, and how she saw some very famous people taking part in those rituals. One of whom was Ted Heath, the Prime Minister of Britain from 70 to 74, who signed us into the European community, now the European Union. Another coincidence, nothing to worry about. And she told me many amazing stories of what she saw in her time at Burnham Beaches. And then I'm just leaving, right, you know, and I've had a cup of tea, like, you know, and I've just finished my cup of tea and I'm just handing it back and I'm preparing to leave. And I turned and I said, funnily enough, you know, I'm having some really funny things happen to me recently, I said. Some really funny things. I keep meeting people who tell me they've seen people turn into reptiles and then go back again. And as I turned, I heard this noise. <gasps> and I turned around and she's grabbed the chest. She can hardly breathe. And she said, my God, I thought it was only me. She said, I wasn't going to tell you this bit. She said, oh my God, I mean, I, I mean what would anyone think of me? I said, you know, I mean, it's bizarre enough talking about satanic ritual involving these people, but I wasn't going to tell you this bit, but I will now. He shapeshifted into a reptile during one, um, well, I didn't have to shapeshift much, Ted, did he? Really? He shapeshifted into a reptile in front of my eyes during one of these ceremonies. And she said, you know the thing that fazed me most? It wasn't even that. It was the fact that no one in the, in the circle was at least bit fazed by it, like it happened all the time. So I'm thinking, not another, bloody hell. Anyway, I then um, have this meeting with these couple of people at the House of Lords. Wanted to ask me what was going on. I thought, you, you, what you're asking me? You know? Why don't you know? Anyway. Uh, there was a lady there and she said some very interesting things about Diana and the assassination and the relationship with the Windsors. So I'm in there straight away. We got a talk and she's a great lady and she um, said that her closest friend was Diana's closest confidant for nine years and she thought that this lady would talk to me but she's not talking to anyone else but she'll talk to you I think. The meeting was arranged. I didn't go to see this lady called Christine Fitzgerald, Diana's confidant, who was acknowledged as such in the media, by the way, um, to talk about shape-shifting reptilians. I went to talk to her about the relationship and the horrific treatment of Diana by the Windsors. So we're into this little discussion, like, and I'm kind of fascinated by what I'm hearing, and it's all in the biggest secret in some detail, what she said. And then she said, um, you know what Diana's nickname for the Windsors was? I said, no, go on. She said, the reptiles and the lizards. And she said, they used to say, in all, she used to say in all seriousness, they're not human. And I'm thinking, not again. And, and then Christine Fitzgerald said to me, she said, you know the Windsors are a reptilian bloodline. They're not actually human. They're a crossbreed bloodline. And I'm thinking, this synchronicity is getting ridiculous. And she told me many things about all this stuff. I then get a call from a friend of mine, scientist friend of mine, great guy in America, who said, I've got someone you've got to meet. There's a woman I've, I'm, I'm, I'm working with who says she conducted sacrificial rituals for the British royal family and others, both sides of the Atlantic. Sacrificial rituals of children, etc., at Balmoral Castle, at Glane's Castle in Scotland, at a notorious satanic ritual centre in Belgium known um, as the Castle of Darkness to those who research this stuff. And I, I would emphasise here for people who haven't read The Biggest Secret, one of the things that you can follow with these bloodlines from ancient Babylon to the present day is satanic ritual, human sacrifice, blood drinking ritual, along with lending people money that doesn't exist and charging them interest on it, which is another scam that this network has played right the way through good light. But that 
is just one of the genetic structures that manifest as these reptilian beings. And of course, all around the world, in the UFO um, extraterrestrial research communities, uh, the, 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 the stories of seeing reptilian beings is, is, is prevalent in the modern world also. Now, as I say, I immediately hired a camera crew to preserve the amazing knowledge this man has. And I'm just going to play you a clip from uh, one of the two videos I did with him, Cradle. And uh, what I asked him was, simple question, what do the Chittahuri look like? It lasts about eight minutes, and this is an amazing human being. Behind the manipulation of humanity for a very, very long time. Now, what do these Chittahuli actually look like, the reptiles. I'm not a good artist. You're better than me, that's for sure. But this is how we believe the Chittahuli look like. They were created in this. You, you see, sir, you white people say that there are alien beings on this earth. No, you are wrong. The earth in which we live has produced 24 different races during its long existence. Please, this is how a Chitauri looks like. It stands about 11 feet high it is a very slender being which seems not to have a bone structure. Its, its fingers have no joints. They are more like, they are more as if the bones in here were flexible. It has, some of the Chitauri have got three claws with a thumb. Some have got six claws with a gut. And some of the Chitauris have got horns on their heads. And what surprises me is this. Some film producers, like the producers who who make the film Star Wars mm -hmm. often show creatures in their films which actually exist, which even the most uneducated of Africans who know this Chitauli can identify. For example, in the new Star Wars film, what is it called? Star Wars are something like that, there is a creature who amazes me called Darth Maul. Darth Maul is a red and black being with a ring of small horns right round his head. That is exactly what the Chitawuli look like. Some have got ordinary without any horns on their on their on their heads. These are the lesser chitaul. But the royal chitaul have got a ring of sharp horns all around their heads. And the very high chitaul, like their king Mubaba Samahongo, they have got a very long horns which grow this way, not that way like a bull, but this way like certain antelope. Now, I wonder, I just wonder where these hidden producers get their information from. And in, in one strange feeling, which my student told, called me to come and watch was a, a, the thing called 
Stargate II. And in that feeling, there was a creature, a very slimy, cream-colored creature, with a heavy wrinkles on its face. It was a speaking likeness of Mubaba Samahongo, the terrible emperor of the Chitauri. Well, clearly, that's a tremendous amount of, of knowledge um, of what's been going on and what is going on, which comes out symbolically through uh, films and uh, areas of uh, communication like um, Hollywood. But the thing that God, I'm totally stunned the more I, I talk to you about this is because I've been uh, all over the world having people give me descriptions of seeing um, uh, reptilian type figures, particularly people in positions of power in the world, uh, changing into a reptilian figure and coming back again. And what they describe seeing is exactly what the knowledge of ancient Africa talks about seeing. We're talking about the same people, there, which is an astonishing uh, confirmation. It, and the eyes is something that keeps coming up being described. Tell me about the eyes of the Chittahuli. So, a warrior Chittahuli has got eyes like a snake. These eyes are yellowish with split pupils and they glow in darkness. So if a Chitauri, a warrior Chitauri, one of the lesser, lesser classes, is hiding in a cave, you can see its eyes burning. But a royal Chitauri has got three eyes got the yellow eyes which glow in a strange almost ice like way like jewels like certain types of yellow jewels and then they have got an eye in the center of their forehead an eye which doesn't close up down like a normal eye does but which closes from side to side and which opens this way. Now this eye of the Chitao is the eye that kills because it can knock a man down just by the fire, the glare that comes out of it. Is this where the um, uh, constant recurring theme of the evil eye comes from? Yes, sir. yes. Sir. In fact, Mubaba, the emperor of the of the Chitauri, who is said to be still alive today, Mubaba has got a central eye. His other two eyes were stitched shut by a jealous wife. But his killing eye, the summer home, the terrible red eye, open. He can even open it like this. Mr. David, I would like to share a little thing with you. It is this. The best way to protect an evil thing is to deny its existence. And if you talk about things such as the Chitauri, if you talk about things such as the Mandinda, there are many people who say to you, rubbish, this thing does not exist. Now, in this way, this great evil is protected by being denied. One day in my long travel through the world, I, I was in New York in that place called Harlem. And I saw a graffito on a wall along a, a passage. And the graffito was, there is no such a thing as the mafia. And we will kill any asshole who says that there is. In this, again and again, in America, People deny the existence of the mafia, and by denying it, actually protect it 
unwittingly or unwittingly. The other interesting thing, or many, one of the other many interesting things that uh, Credo talks about is the greys, who aren't apparently grey. Because of the arrogance of the European and American, North American continent in so many areas, if it doesn't happen there, then it don't happen. That African continent is a library of astonishing information which is being ignored. And here we are still having um, debates and arguments over whether grey alien beings were found at Roswell in 1947 when for centuries in Africa the African tribes people have been finding these beings and on occasion cutting them up. And Credo was there when this was done with one of these dead greys. And uh, he said that the outer grey shell is just that, an amazing substance, but it's a shell. And he said to break through it, in his words, you need not just a new axe, but a new axe sharpened as sharp as it will go to break through it. And he said when you break through it and you look inside, there is a scaly creature which is a pink colour which is known in um, um, Africa um, in that form as Pinky Pinky and he said the black eyes are not black eyes they are highly sophisticated goggles which protect the eyes inside the being from the sunlight because for some reason they seem to have a problem in bright sunlight and he said when you see the real eyes of the being inside they are reptilian and they go straight down uh, and not, a, not um, in, in terms of uh, having a round pupil like, um, like humans. And there is so much knowledge in Africa that is being ignored because it didn't happen in New York, it didn't happen in London. Another thing that um, they, uh, people talk about is seeing a kind of a, an ethereal reptilian type figure locked into the lower two chakras of people. I've heard this story repeated again and again around the world by people of, uh, uh, who, who, who are consciously going into other dimensions and seeing some of this stuff. And this is what we call possession. The more that I understand this, the more it's clear that in these um, secret society and satanic rituals and stuff, they're actually creating the energy field through the ritual that plugs the people in to this dimension of consciousness which then basically takes them over. And it's interesting when you look at the history of Adolf Hitler, this guy had, had a charisma bypass earlier in his life, this chap. I mean, he was, when he was painting in the street and stuff, people would pass him by, wouldn't look twice. And then he was taken through a series of uh, black magic rituals by a guy called Eckhart and at the other end of them emerged this strutting man we know as Adolf Hitler. And when you, you read the accounts of people who knew him, they say he was like a medium, he would like be taken over, he would, he would like uh, be very uh, um, less than charismatic and then suddenly something would emerge and we, they would see a different Hitler and this happened time and time again, not least on the, uh, on the uh, Nuremberg rally stages and stuff like that. And what Eckhart wrote to his friend was that they should not worry about him because he had changed the history of Germany forever because he had connected Hitler with them. And therefore, if these lower fourth dimensional beings are working through certain three dimensional bloodlines wearing it like a spacesuit to operate in this three-dimensional world, it means if you can put one of these bloodlines in a position of power, you are putting this fourth-dimensional entity into that position of power. And that will become very relevant in a second when we look at some of the genealogy of the leading families today. This is a um, painting by a Dutch artist, I think he was. He was depicting, he said, a race trapped in a time-space dimension. And interestingly, he chose reptiles to symbolize this race. And the more I look at this, and the more I move along this road, it seems that somehow in the far, far ancient distant past, these reptilian beings 
were put into some kind of time-space prison which they're now breaking out of and have been breaking out of for a while. And you start to see the symbolism of St. Michael, this Venetian deity, who was said, if you, if you look in uh, Revelation, uh, he was said to have thrown Satan, the great serpent, into the abyss. And you see the symbolism of St. George, the Phoenician deity who defeated the dragon. A lot of the stories um, that you see, famous stories, many of them, um, are actually depicting a truth. Bram Stoker, who wrote um, Dracula, was a high initiate of this secret society network. And if you look at the symbolism of Dracula, well, it's all there. First of all, Count Dracula, bloodline, aristocratic bloodline. He couldn't go out in sunlight. He needed to drink blood to survive and exist. And from what I understand from people um, uh, on the inside, for some reason, these guys have to drink blood to hold their three-dimensional human form. And what is for sure, whether that's true or not, you can follow the blood drinking ceremonies of these bloodlines from ancient uh, Babylon right through to the present day, and I mean the present day. And interestingly, Draco, we talk about Dracula, Draco, the star system, is another um, area that keeps coming up in terms of where these beings come from, including in Credo Mutwa's um, um, African legend and African uh, stories. And draconian certainly is a word that sums up the Illuminati. The classic depiction of the devil or Satan has many, many of the attributes that are described in, um, in the descriptions of these um, reptilian beings, these Chittahuri, as uh, Mutwa talks about. The other thing he says is that some of the, these more older um, reptilian beings gather some kind of cartilage thing at the bottom of the chin which kind of grows as they get uh, very old and interestingly that's similar to what's depicted in the, the um, headgear of uh, some of the pharaohs in Egypt and there's the snake again um, on that. Now like I say the epicenter at operational level of this Illuminati, these bloodlines, is the city of London, the financial district and around that area. And you know when you um, when you're going through life and you're not noticing something and then someone says to you, hey, have you seen that bloody new car that's come out? And you say, I haven't seen it. Oh, there's one, look, look. And you see this new car, you haven't seen it before. Now you've seen it. From that moment on, you keep seeing these new cars everywhere. It's because someone's removed the blind spot and you're, you're kind of seeing something you weren't seeing before. When you, when you move around the world, particularly London and the city of London, I have to say, the reptilian serpent symbolism in front of your face just is all over the place. When you enter the city of London, this epicenter of the Illuminati, you have to pass flying reptiles as you enter that part of what we call the metropolis of London. And that red cross on the white background was an ancient Phoenician symbol which became the flag of England, the flag of St. George appropriately. Um, there's an area, here's the, here's the coat of arms of the City of London Financial District. Um, flying reptiles. I actually took this picture at Burnham Beaches, um, that area that they own where this um, Satanism stuff goes on. Now there's an area of London where, a small area, where there are more elite secret societies per square inch than anywhere else in the world in my experience. It's the area we know as the City of London, the financial district, and the next area it's joined to, which is called Temple Bar. Temple Bar is the centre, not just of the British, but of the global legal profession. It's called Temple Bar because the Knights Templar, who we're going to mention as we go along, um, owned that land at one time. Now, if you're going to stitch up a human race in the present structure of society, you need to control the finance, City of London, and you need to control the law, Temple Bar. At the point 
where the City of London Financial District meets Temple Bar is this massive flying reptile in the middle of the road. That is the City of London, that's Temple Bar, that's one of the law courts, and you get that in the centre of the road. A lot of these aristocratic families who are manifestations of these bloodlines have flying reptiles in their coats of arms. Uh, this is the Marlborough family, an offshoot of which was Winston Churchill, that's based at Blenheim Palace uh, near Oxford. And the great cathedrals of Europe, like Notre Dame, which is not Mother Mary, by the way, it's Queen Semiramis, um, Our Lady of Babylon, um, in Paris, and the cathedrals of Britain, they were built overwhelmingly with Knights Templar Illuminati money. And they were put on the major vortex points, like Chartres Cathedral near Paris, um, was, was the, the point where that was built was not just a, uh, a druidic ritual center for that area of France, they came from all over Europe to do druidic rituals at that point. They put them on the vortex points. They built them full of sacred geometry and esoteric knowledge. And again and again, on the cathedrals and on the castles and the stately homes of the aristocracy, you find these reptile figures we call gargoyles. If you go to um, Sandringham, uh, where Princess Diana was brought up near there, right on that estate, uh, and you go uh, to uh, the main gate of Sandringham, where of course the royal family spent uh, chunks of the year, there are reptile figures right across the main gate. Wherever you look, you see this thing. And there's a place in America called Denver Airport. It's kind of a new airport. Strange thing, massively over budget. And there's a guy uh, called um, Schneider, Phil Schneider, who came out and died as a result, um, saying that he built um, some of these underground uh, bases in America. And that some of them were extraterrestrial bases where the extraterrestrials interacted with the human elite and some of them were reptilian and he pointed to one of them being Denver Airport, a brand new airport that was massively over budget and uh, there's some very very strange things about it. Not least in Denver Airport, a modern airport in America, they have stone gargoyles in it. The reptilian symbolism, once the, once the uh, blind spots gone, you start to see it everywhere where you didn't see it before. And these, the Windsors, are one of these bloodlines. And this solves another uh, mystery, which I always wondered as a child. I always wondered why the Queen had these long bloody things trailing behind her, and now I know it was to um, hide her tail. <laughs> um, the um, Fortean Times um, did this on its front page in the latest edition, taking the piss out of me. Thank you, it sold a hell of a lot of books. Will you do it in the next edition as well, please? Um, um, uh, depicting the, the Queen as um, um, actually a, a front for a reptilian figure. Yeah. I've lost, do you think I've lost my knighthood? Do you reckon I get my knighthood now? I think it's gone, don't you? Yeah, thank God for that. And the story of Diana is also about genetics, about bloodline, and about wanting her bloodline fused with the Windsors. As she used to call herself to Christine Fitzgerald, she said, I'm just the Windsors' brood mare, and that's all they wanted her for. Now, going along with these bloodlines, and I'll come back to that in a second, uh, when uh, we get to the genealogy of the ruling families today, which is extraordinary, um, the bloodlines have worked through, in this period of thousands of years, um, a secret society network, which has helped to hide dramatically what's going on. Now, these bloodlines have changed their name from time to time, so people think, oh, well, they stopped there, and they always oh, somebody else. They're actually the same bloodline. They just changed their name so we lose the plot. And uh, the secret societies have done the same. Like I said earlier, the Freemasons have just changed their name. They've actually existed um, all the way through, but that, that offshoot just became known as the Freemasons in the 1600s, 1700s. I'll give you an example of how this works. Around the time of the Crusades, 11, 1200s, there were three knights organizations which emerged around the same time in Jerusalem, which are still going today and have among their number the top people in global politics, business, banking, military, etc. 
One of them was called the Teutonic Knights, which of course relate to Germany, and it was through that Teutonic Knight network in Germany that the Nazis were created to emerge um, in this century. Actually, this is being videoed, so um, if you're listening in a few weeks, last century. <laughs> the um, other one was called the Knights Hospitaller of St. John of Jerusalem, which today in its Protestant version is called the Knights of St. John of Jerusalem, and its official head is the Queen, and in its Catholic version are called the Knights of Malta, with the Maltese cross, the official, version, uh, the official head of which is the Pope. I love the Pope, by the way. Do you like the Pope? I love the Pope. I think he's great. I love the Pope when he's bouncing along in that Pope mobile behind three and a half inches of bulletproof plexiglass. I love that, you know. I mean, that's faith in bloody action, isn't it? <laughs> and the third one, which I'm going to concentrate on for a few minutes, is the Knight Templar. The Knight Templar official story is that they were set up to protect pilgrims visiting the Holy Land. Well, there's nine of these buggers for the first nine years. They're going to protect a lot of pilgrims. Cover story. They parked their buns next to Temple Mount in Jerusalem. And after this nine years, suddenly things started to motor very fast. A couple of them came back to France, where they were created by the St. Clair family, which became the Scottish Sinclair family. And suddenly they started to sign up and recruit some of the noble families of France and Europe. And to join the Templars, you had to give them your wealth and land, so they seriously knew something. As a result, the Templars became massively wealthy. And they um, had, in Paris and London, their two financial centers. And they uh, made even more money by lending money that didn't exist and charging interest on it. The old scam played by these bloodlines all the way through to the present day. By 1307, the King of France, Philip the Fair, who was up to his neck in debt to the Templars, like the crown heads of Europe, um, just like the, uh, the governments of the world are today. Same story, just a bigger version of it today. Um, he issued uh, secret orders, which weren't secret enough, to arrest the Templars in France on Friday the 13th, in October 1307. That's why Friday the 13th has been considered unlucky ever since. Some of the Templars were arrested, most of them got away, and they went, because they had a massive fleet by this time, in two directions for sure, probably three. The probably was to the Americas, because of the Phoenicians that went long before, among others, they knew in this underground stream of knowledge that the Americas existed long before Columbus um, um, got himself in his ship. But the two places they went for sure, first of all, was down into Portugal, where they operated behind a Christian front called the Knights of Christ. The most famous um, Grand Master of the Knights of Christ was a guy called Prince Henry the Navigator. And this is extremely relevant because one of the sea captains close to Prince Henry the Navigator was the father-in-law of Christopher Columbus. Christopher Columbus was not looking for India and kind of tripped over the Americas. Oh, what's this? He knew it was there. They knew it was there for a long time. This was just the time to start um, occupying the Americas and destroying those cultures. So Columbus played the photo opportunity to do it. Um, and Christopher Columbus um, was employed by two of the key bloodline families. One of them, the House of Lorraine, a key family to this day. The other family was the Dumadici family. The Dumadici family funded and sponsored Leonardo da Vinci, the Grand Master of the Priory of Siam. And the Dumadici family and the House of Lorraine employed two other famous people. One was Christopher Columbus. The other was Nostradamus. Nostradamus's phenomenal knowledge compared with the rest of the population he didn't just manifest out of midair. He had access to this underground stream of knowledge that has been held outside the public arena. And the House of Lorraine remains a major bloodline to this day. Um, the other guy who discovered, it says here, North America, was called John Cabot. Conventional history has never put Columbus and Cabot together, but you can. 
not least through a Freemasonic historian called Manly P. Hall in America, who shows that both Cabot, whose real name was Giovanni Cabotto, a naturalized Venetian, and Columbus operated in Genoa at the same time and were members of the same secret society network. Columbus finds there, Cabot leaves the Templar port of Bristol to find that within four or five years of each other. Just a coincidence, nothing to worry about. It's all orchestrated. Now this is Chris. Interesting story, interesting question really. Why did they call him Columbus when he used to sign his name Colon? I think they used to call him Colon because he was full of shit. No, they didn't know, no, it was really bad. But I said that to a, to a Christian patriot guy in America. I said, you know this Colin Powell, this military guy, why do you call him Colin and not Colin? And he said, because he's full of shit. <laughs> Good answer, really. But why do they call him Columbus? Everything is symbolism, everything is ritual. In ancient Babylon, like I mentioned earlier, they uh, worshipped, part of their trinity was Queen Semiramis, who they symbolized as a dove. And indeed, if you're looking at the symbolic taken literally, when you look at the story of Noah, you see the dove bearing the branch. Queen Semiramis was symbolized as a dove, and the word Semiramis means branch bearer. When the... Um, the Illuminati moved their center from Babylon to Rome, as I mentioned earlier. They worshipped Semiramis in the Roman Empire under the title Venus Columba, Venus the Dove. Indeed, in France today, I understand, a French guy told me, the word for dove is still Columba. So, when Columbus, Colon, was crossing the Atlantic, he was bearing the branch of the Illuminati to start the influx of people into the Americas and create what they have created. This is why Washington DC is in the district of Columbia. This is why we have Columbia Pictures, Columbia Broadcasting, CBS, Columbia University. It's Semiramis under another name, symbolism of the Illuminati. Now, like I said earlier, the British Crown took over the Americas, but they wanted to move from overt control to covert control. Enter a number of people known as Founding Fathers. It's just a story about that, but it's also indicative of what's happening today all around us, if we would only get streetwise to it. When you talk to people in America about this guy, Benjamin Franklin, they still go like starry-eyed and glassy-eyed and teary-eyed about this man's record of fighting for freedom. This guy was Illuminati, like a lot of them were. Like I said earlier, of the 56 signatories to the American Declaration of Independence, 50 were known Freemasons, only one was known not to be. That doesn't mean because you're a Freemason you're involved, most of them aren't, but a significant number of them are when they get to that level of influence. And this guy, while the revolution was going on, in the run-up to it, parked his ass in London, 28 Craven Street, near Trafalgar Square. And he was a member of an elite, satanic, blood-drinking, here we go, human sacrifice secret society called the Hellfire Club, based on um, the estate of a British government minister called Sir Francis Dashwood at Wickham. And this guy was a British intelligence operative manipulating co overt control into covert control from London of America. Now, I don't know if you saw this story, but a couple of years ago, I suppose it was now, uh, the story broke that they were renovating 28 Craven Street with a grant, 1.5 million pounds, I think, something like that, to turn it into a kind of museum to Benjamin Franklin's life near Trafalgar Square. They start digging the floor up. They find ten bodies, six of them children, which had, had strange things done to them. And this article is kind of saying, well, he and his mate must have been into body snatching for medical research. When you see the rest of Franklin's um, history, there might be another explanation for this. So, we move into the point where uh, the Americas um, are apparently turned over to the American people with the War of Independence. And the first um, president was George Washington, a massively high degree Freemason, a British aristocratic bloodline. And we come all the way through to now, and here you have George Bush, president, one of the bloodlines, shapeshifter extraordinaire, 
and who is over the horizon in terms of becoming the next president of the United States in the year 2000, just, um, well, less than a year away now. George W. Bush, his son. Because presidents and people in political power are not elected, they are selected by bloodline. Now what I'm going to do, in the next few little while, there's George Bush again, rising sun, and again, symbolism you'll find, rising sun, here comes the sun, in these Illuminati magazines like Time and Newsweek. What I'm going to do now is just go through one bloodline. I emphasize that this is the same bloodline. And it's an interim report because doing genealogy is incredibly time consuming and painstaking. Some of the sources for this are Burt's Peerage, the Bible of Aristocratic and Royal Genealogy in Britain, uh, the Boston Historical Genealogical Society, and a number of other genealogists who are working to um, follow the, the ruling bloodlines back to their origin. Um, today. Amalgamated that, and this is an interim report only on this bloodline. It starts off with the ancient royal lines of Egypt, Sumer, Phoenicians and Babylon. Just remember that the Sumerian tablets say that the crossbreed creation of the gods and humans were put into the positions of ruling royal power in that ancient Near and Middle East. This bloodline comes down through Philip of Macedonia, who was the father of Alexander the Great, who, before he died in Babylon at the age of 33, had plundered that whole area that we keep seeing on that map of the Near and Middle East, and also gone into India. Comes down through Cleopatra, the Cleopatra the, uh, of Egypt, who had children with Julius Caesar and Mark Antony. Comes down through Herod the Great, who was the king in the Jesus stories. Interestingly, it also comes down through the Piso family, a Roman aristocratic family, who as I, I present evidence in The Biggest Secret, and there's a, a website called the Piso homepage, which goes into this particular subject in even greater detail. The evidence for me is overwhelming that this Piso family wrote what became the Gospel stories, and they put it in a historical context, including one of their relatives, um, Herod the Great. And when you look at the Jesus stories, they are constantly recurring stories that can be found thousands of years before Christianity was even thought of. Now, in 325 AD at the Council of Nicaea in what we now call Turkey, a Roman emperor called Constantine the Great took those gospel stories that had manifested as the Christian religion and he created the foundation of the Christian religious structure to this day known as the Nicene Creed. The Nicene Creed. Constantine the Great who did that is the same bloodline as the Pisos. We come down through the Merovingians. Now through books like Holy Blood, Holy Grail and others in recent times, the Merovingian bloodline in France has become much more kind of uh, identified and looked at. The Merovingians were a, uh, a royal bloodline. And there are some people, I would suggest, because they've not quite seen the bigger picture, and there are some people who are doing it knowingly to mislead and divert, who are claiming that the Merovingians, and therefore all the people that come off from them to the present day, are the bloodline of Jesus. Why, am I, why is the word bullshit kind of resonating through my mind when I say that? Nonsense. They are an important bloodline relevant to the control of the world, but it has nothing to do with Jesus. Just a diversion, I would strongly suggest. And interestingly, the Merovingians, talking about symbolism, the Merovingians were the people who created the city called Paris. And the Merovingians worshipped uh, one of the great goddesses of the ancient world, the goddess Diana. And they built sacrificial underground ritual places just outside the original Paris to do their rituals and sacrifice to the goddess Diana. That spot today has become very famous. It's called the Pont d'Alma Tunnel where Diana died. Charlemagne, the most famous monarch of what we call France, same bloodline. Since 1776, 
Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of people have lived in the United States and call themselves Americans. Not only that, that phenomenal number of people, there's 260 million Americans now, never mind, add them all up in the past. Those people not only are incredibly numerous, they came from a massively diverse genetic pool. You would have thought, therefore, that there's just a bit of a chance that within the 42 only of them who've become President of the United States, there would be just a little bit of genetic diversity. Makes a bit of sense? No. 33, and this is conventional genealogical sources, 33 of those 42 alone go back to Charlemagne. The Habsburgs, who control the Ro Holy Roman Empire, even the Roly Roman Empire, I mean, it sounds more fun. Um, for centuries, same bloodline. The de Medici family, the House of Lorraine, same bloodline. Comes down through the Plantagenet royal dynasty, um, which manifested a number of monarchs in Britain. King John, who signed the Magna Carta. Uh, the Stuart dynasty, same bloodline. Down through the Georges, George III, who was the king at the time of the American Revolution, etc. Down through the present royal family, Queen Elizabeth and, and uh, Prince Charles, etc. We go through the French royal dynasties, down to um, Louis XVI, whose wife, Marie Antoinette, same bloodline. They were killed in the French Revolution, but their um, little boy prince um, was saved and later turns up in America under the name Daniel Pazur. And when you look behind the so-called great American industrial um, empires of Morgan, of um, all these other uh, people, Carnegie, you find the real controller was Daniel Pazur, same bloodline. Comes down through the presidents of the United States, George Washington the first, and all the way down through these, through George Bush to George W. Bush, who, unless we can derail it by information getting into the public domain, will be the next president of the United States. It comes down through the Scottish bloodline families, the Lords of Galloway and uh, uh, Mary Louise of Austria, who was the wife of Napoleon. Everywhere you look, the bloodline's there in history. Kaiser Wilhelm II, the king at the time of the First World War in Germany. Uh, Maximilian, Emperor of Mexico, he was the Habsburg. The Rothschilds, the Rockefellers, same bloodline. And that's why this guy is where he is and why he's just broken the record for money raising for a Republican presidential candidate. Another place the uh, Templars went after the uh, purge was around the west coast of Ireland and into Scotland. And there, later, they re-emerged under another name, the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry. The Scottish Rite of Freemasonry is the biggest secret society in the world. Pervades world politics, world business, world banking, 